Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our event on gender, power, and arms, organized by the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy in cooperation with the Women International League for Peace and Freedom, the International Coalition to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, and the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots. I'm Giorgio Franceschini. I'm the head of the Foreign and Security Policy Division here at the Heinrich Böll Foundation, and on behalf of our foundation, I would like to wel welcome you all to our event. Originally, we planned to have a much smaller event with about 50 people in the room over here, and uh, we just changed uh, the, the, the room because we were actually overwhelmed by the feedback that so many people um, joined us today. So um, we are delighted to, see, to have you with us. As you can see from the conveners, uh, we meet today at the intersection of disarmament and feminism. Um, two topics which we follow closely here at the Böll Foundation, though not very often in combination. We had an event called My Nuclear Button is Bigger Than Yours, a feminist critique of the atomic bomb in 2018, inspired, if I can say inspired, by a tweet of Donald Trump, but most of the time, the spheres of gender politics and security policy do not overlap in our everyday work. The main reason is probably intellectual inertia, or let's call it laziness. I, for example, I was trained as a security analyst and feel relatively comfortable when dealing with issues of arms control, disarmament, non-proliferation and deterrence, looking at these issues through a gendered lens is much more challenging. And this is what we will try to do this evening. Let me say that this event comes at the right moment for two reasons. The year 2020 might be the last year where US and Russian strategic nuclear weapons will be limited by a bilateral treaty, the so-called New START Treaty. New START expires at the beginning of next year, and so far the US administration did not show any interest in renewing the treaty, thus sparking the fear of a new nuclear arms race in the following years. At the same time, 2020 is also the year where we celebrate 20 years of the landmark UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. On that note of nuclear worries and feminist optimism, I give now the floor to Christina Lunds from the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy for her introductory remarks. Thank you for being with us and enjoy the evening. Hey everyone, ladies, gentlemen, everyone in between. My name is Christina Lunz and I'm the co-founder of the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy. That's a research and advocacy organization promoting a feminist approach to foreign and security policy. And we're doing this because the, the most significant factor towards whether a country is peaceful within its own borders or towards other countries is the level of gender equality. So that means there's not going to be any peace without feminism. So whilst we are the world's first organization fully, completely dedicated to feminist foreign policy, we are by no means pioneers. Neither was it Sweden in 2014 when they introduced a feminist foreign policy, nor was it Canada or France or Mexico who followed. Instead, we're actually all standing on the shoulders of giants. It was already in 1915 that 1,500 feminists gathered in The Hague at the International Congress of Women to demand an end to the Great War, and more precisely, to demand a focus on mediation for conflict settlement, democratic control of foreign affairs, including equal representation of um, men and women, and the dismantling of the military-industrial complex. And here I quote, 
The Congress sees the private profits accruing from the great armament factories a powerful hindrance to the abolition of war, read one of their final resolutions in 1915. And now, a hundred years later, disarmament continues to be a core demand for feminist thinkers in international affairs. Compared to 1915, it seems ever more relevant. Global military expenditures are higher today than during the cold than during the late Cold War era, era, even when adjusted for inflation. The net sales of a single arms producer like Lockheed Martin are roughly nine times as much as the whole UN peacekeeping budget. And these days, as Giorgio just mentioned, we find ourselves thrown back to, what's, to what it to what seems to be a new nuclear armament competition and at the same time a new generation of weaponry is being developed. Fully autonomous weapon systems, so-called killer robots. The development of both nuclear weapons as well as killer robots are based on toxic masculinity and a gendered understanding of what it means to be powerful. We want to challenge those assumptions. This is why we're here today. The campaign to stop killer robots, as well as the international campa campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, are both international civil society-led campaigns leading the way in challenging these established norms of power and gender. And ahead of the second meeting of the so-called Stockholm Initiative, which is taking place here in Berlin tomorrow, initiated by the Swedish government and where they work closely with the Germans, and in an attempt to foster this and they're doing it in an attempt to foster disarmament, but which unfortunately excludes civil society, we're meeting here today. So both campaigns in collaboration with us, the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, and the Women's International League for Peace and, uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom Sweden, invite you all to now discuss the interlinkages of international armament, discrimination, masculinities, and gender inequality. This event here would not be possible without the incredible support personally by you, Giorgio, and the Heinrich Böll Foundation. And it is financed by the international campaign to stop killer robots. And we could not be prouder to start off this event with a keynote, keynote by Anu Damale. Anu, thank you for being here, is the UK director of women of Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security, an organization set up by US Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins to advance the leadership and professional development of women of color in the fields of international peace, security, and conflict transformation so that they can champion minority perspectives to solve global issues. Anu is part of the verification and monitoring team at Vertic, working on solving arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation issues using science, technology, and policy. Anu, thank you for your work. We appreciate it so much. The floor is, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for choosing to spend your evening with us today um, and choosing to engage in this increasingly important discussion surrounding the future of peace and security. Uh, my name is Anu. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, and yeah, I am the UK director of the new branch of Women of Colour Advancing Peace and Security in the UK. Um, I also work at Vertic, which is an international security NGO dedicated to bringing together science, technology, and policy. Um, now, I'm coming from this from two different lenses. I have a background in physics, um, and I spent five years working to encourage scientific institutions in the UK to aim for more diversity, not just gender diversity, but using gender as a starting point. Um, the reason for this is not to tick boxes um, and not just to show people that, wow, we have a woman on our panel, how amazing. Uh, no, the reason is because it actually ultimately benefits society. And we're using the same frameworks now in the field of arms control, non-proliferation and disarmament because it is the only way to move past the policy failures of the past that have led to a world within which Every sector, apart from security, is global and interrelated. Security still exists in a silo, and within security, every technology also exists in a silo. Every security is treated as a closed box. 
I thought I'd use today to uh, step away from the jargon and the specific fields and set the scene for the panel discussion, which I'm sure will be amazing. Um, so the core of the general gender equality debate is the acknowledgement that women, non-binary people and men have the right to engage with and critique matters that affect them. There's also plenty of evidence from many sectors that demonstrate that diverse and inclusive teams encourage innovation and lend themselves to being more proactive in preempting problems and providing more sustainable solutions. So several institutions, I'm from the UK, if you can tell from my accent, um, such as McKinsey, the Institute of Physics, the Royal Society and institutes in the United States, such as Girls Security and the home branch of WCAPS have demonstrated this. More specifically to this field, of course, the Home of Feminist Foreign Policy, Sweden, um, has a uh, central part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs dedicated to feminist foreign policy. And in Germany, there's now a branch for the Centre for Feminist Foreign Policy. So there's clearly recognition. We know that this is an issue. We know that we need to bring women to the negotiating table, uh, especially as new problems in the field continue to emerge. The fact is the threats facing humanity will increase in their diversity and in their impact and delivery. And so having the same people in the room is no longer acceptable. We're also running out of a world where there are only old white men. So we really need to engage more people. Um, the people at the table should, by that logic, be also able to provide a variety in the solutions and instruments that they suggest to deal with the problems that they're facing. And that variety can no longer be provided by a small fraction of society who, largely speaking, have had similar experiences through life. Nothing is a replacement for tacit knowledge and human experience. There is nothing, no education that can replace that. Um, but there are several difficulties that we need to face head on while we slowly actively create enough social and political capital to slowly but surely open up the black box of international security to a wider variety of people and values. So UNIDA, the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Affairs, um, have done a big study on gender and disarmament. And three themes emerge with regards to barriers to greater engagement of women within the field. The first are the characteristics of the field itself, of the field of peace, security, international security, diplomacy, how they present themselves. This is the first barrier. The second barrier is work-life balance. And the third barrier is seeing people who look like you in positions of power or even in positions that you want to reach to. So allow me to touch on a few of these just to get the discussion going. War is inherently a concept that rose from masculine, not male, norms, and nuclear weapons are a technology that were born from a war. As great power governments uh, and their defense departments continue to justify their unshaken focus on nuclear deterrence, a concept which in and of itself is changing given the investment in tactical nuclear weapons, whatever that means, um, non-proliferation and nuclear posture fields have been described as becoming a lot more insulated, a lot more male dominated and a lot more unwelcoming. Now this comes from a very good report by Renata Dewan, who's the director for UNIDA. Um, and this field the field is filled with people with deep knowledge in very specific areas. Um, and that knowledge is treated as protected. It's their knowledge and they're the expert in that. And no one else is allowed to touch it. And this discourages, like, this discourages engagement of new people and of new approaches. And that has snowballed. That continues to snowball. And the absence of senior white men at discussions on gender, if you could just quickly look around the room. Yeah, so I would say it's about 85% female. We were discussing this earlier. Um, the absence of senior white men at discussions on gender means that gender discussions are normally treated as something to be tolerated rather than made a substantive and centered point of mainstream discussion. Um, many institutions are now encouraging the mainstreaming of gender discussions, including the UN, um, NGOs, including the WILPF, uh, the CFFP, WCAT, and a small shout out to my own organization, Vertic, uh, continue to ensure that at the grassroots and medium level, to, uh, the presence and influence of women is the norm. Please continue to engage with these institutions and support them. They're very important. Um, there are lots of small things that we can do at our own organizations, at our own universities, creating work environments uh, or conferences which are accessible and inclusive in every way possible ultimately benefits everyone. Uh, 
Having women deliver statements that they've often actually done the work for uh, normalizes having a wider range of people delivering statements. Flexible working arrangements, which are useful for working mothers, actually allow for workers to be happy, a wild concept, um, and in turn for them to provide better work. Promoting mentorship networks and spaces for women to grow in confidence empowers us. This isn't meant to be the patronizing idea of a safe space that people seem to parody nowadays. It is a space where there are fewer barriers to skills development. This will contribute to seeing more women role models. Um, it provides clarity on career paths. It provides clarity on allies that some might be more comfortable in approaching. So gender should be a substantive talking point going forward, starting from recruitment at organizations to negotiations of international treaties. This also means not treating women as one homogenous community. There is a lot of diversity within women themselves, um, all with a wealth of perspectives and experiences. So I urge everyone here to consider making gendered approaches one that encompass these intersections. People of color, LGBTQ people, people of different religious upbringings, people of different nationalities, people of different socioeconomic backgrounds. They all have different experiences and that is the only way that we can truly diversify the international security space. All that notwithstanding, the fact remains that arms control and security are fields that are going to continue to grow in complexity and size. Diversifying the field can only help in diversifying how we attack and understand the intents, framings and possible pathways of new technologies and new weapons programs. At a time where we need to put our best foot forward, surely the best ideas, no matter where they come from, should win. Thank you very much. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Nina Bernarding and I'm um, the second co-director of the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy here in Germany. And I have the pleasure of moderating this amazing panel um, tonight. So in addition to Anu and Georgiou, who both have been introduced to you, um, I have here with me Gabriela Irsten, who is the policy and advocacy Oth officer at Wolf Sweden. And you mainly work on foreign and security policy issues, including disarmament, arms control, and the women, peace, and security agenda. You have previously worked with Reaching Critical Will, which is the disarmament program of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom in, in Geneva. Um, and you have also worked at the UN headquarters in New York on issues related to space security. Um, we also have uh, Sarah Martin with us. Thank you for being here, specifically under the, the difficult circumstances. Um, you're a lead associate with Gender Associations, an amazing organization who was recently founded by one of our friends, Nikola Popovich, here in Berlin. Um, you have more than 20 years of work experience in research, advocacy, training, and project management with different international organizations, and you're specialized in strengthening prevention and response to gender-based violence. Um, we've also worked with a different, of the range of different organizations, including UNHCR in Jordan, the International Committee of the Red Cross, the Small Arms Survey, and many different UN agencies. Welcome. Um, well, Gabriela, let me start with, with the campaigns, because as Christina said in the beginning, um, we, we are part of the campaign to stop killer robots, but we also work closely with the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. And we, we thought that both campaigns have similar objectives. So why don't have a, an event of bringing these two campaigns together and talk about um, the, the synergies of the different campaigns? And WILF is part of both campaigns. So maybe you can just give us a bit of an overview why these two campaigns were, were founded and what was the reasoning behind it? Hi everyone. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Now. Hi everyone. Um, well, if there's a disarmament campaign, we'll fizz in it. <laughs> um, well, the two campaigns are very similar in methodology and theory, but also very uh, different. The I I can is based on uh, an old uh, anti-nuclear movement. Uh, with, and the campaign to stop killer robots is a very uh, much more newer one uh, 
uh, built around a lot of tech workers. Um, and while they're both similar in, meth uh, in methodology, um, so the methodology is both campaign uh, work from what we call humanitarian uh, disarmament. So that's the method in theory. A lot of uh, disarmament and arms, like you've already talked about, but that we will talk more about, uh, has usually been framed around security. So um, in very technical language uh, around security, and you have this many bombs, therefore I have have this many bombs. It's mutual destruction and things like that. So humanitarian disarmament, takes weapons and explains from a perspective of what do these weapons do with people and the world when they're used or even when they're just produced because they take so much money away from other things that we could invest in. So humanitarian disarmament is putting the person, human beings in the center and international law in the center and human rights in the center. Uh, and this, is, this is, has been a movement. Um, we saw uh, banning landmines and cluster munitions. And this is just a continuation of that movement. Um, and we're taking on more bigger and bigger weapons, more and more complex weapons, and weapons that haven't even really been produced yet as uh, killer robots, autonomous weapons that are uh, not yet in use, but the production of them are, is very close to, um, to finish. Um, it's also, both campaigns are also built on what I would like to call um, a, a democratic process because it uses language and uh, methods that everyone can understand. The technical language of disarmament is very much, like you talked about, it's very difficult to understand. You have to have technical expertise. You have to understand difficult words uh, that just go uh, above your head. Um, so this is also a democratic process of explaining things that we all understand and how these weapons actually affect us. Um, I also think that it's a type of, uh, it's a new type of movement, uh, a new type of civil society where the people actually don't trust, maybe trust the, uh, the power to, to take care of it. So we're taking care of it ourselves. We're becoming more professionalized. So we're going into the UN, helping governments to negotiate these treaties. We're not letting them do the work themselves. Um, so that's kind of the, uh, the forefront of those two campaigns. Um, and can you just remind us when, when the two campaigns were founded? Uh, the, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> ICANN was founded, exactly. ICANN was founded 2007, and the campaign was founded 2013 or 2014. Uh, now, yeah, I'm, yeah. 14, yeah. 14. Yeah. Um, Giorgio, you, as you said in the beginning, you, you consider yourself as a traditional security expert. Um, and you've basically watched the two campaigns grow from the outset. You were, uh, you were a researcher at the Peace, of the, the Peace Research Institute in Frankfurt working on nuclear disarmament. How was it to see the two campaigns evolve from, from a bit detached position? Um, I think both campaigns um, were refreshing. Because um, if I start with ICANN, for example, ICANN entered the nuclear debate and you are still in that nuclear debate. And let's face it, the classical nuclear debate is incredibly boring, it's full of jargon, and it's very abstract. It, the nuclear debate is about deterrence, strategic stability, uh, balance of nuclear forces. What does that mean? What does that mean? And ICANN finally came there and said, okay, let's have a look what a detonation of a typical nuclear weapon in the 21st century means. How large is a typical nuclear weapon of the 21st century? It has a, a yield of 150 kilotons, that's 10 times Hiroshima. All right, that's the typical nuclear weapons in, in the US or Russian arsenal, they're even bigger ones. Um, what about Hiroshima? I can, well, took the Hibakushas, the survivors of Hiroshima, to, to, to international fora and let them tell their story again because people tend to forget what a nuclear detonation means. And um, I can uh, 
told us what the environmental consequences of uh, a larger nuclear exchange might be like. There were powerful simulation if India and Pakistan, for example, exchanged in a, in a, nuclear, uh, in a nuclear exchange, uh, what, what consequences we would have, famines, uh, uh, millions of people starving, and, 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 and really apocalyptic scenarios. And I think that that was very helpful because I can re, uh, remind it us that nuclear weapons are here, they are dangerous, and we can talk about them in these abstract terms of deterrence and, 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 and strategic stability, but we should also be aware of their humanitarian and environmental consequences. And just to give you an example how, how real the nuclear threat is, two days ago I read a tweet by um, the Federation of American Scientists, and they said um, the U.S. just made the U.S. Um, Secretary of Defense, Aspen, just made a, a war game, something he does on a regular base, and the war game was like a simulation, so it was not a real war, a simulation, and how he would react on a limited uh, nuclear attack by Russia in the, I think, in the, in the Baltic region. And then, you know, uh, in a war game, you go through options and, and, and how, how shall I retaliate and how shall I retaliate? And then, let's say his response was a so-called limited nuclear strike. That's what we know. Okay, it was a simulation, but again, you know, let's have a look. What does a limited nuclear strike mean in Europe? And... I can was a, in that sense an eye opener and helped us to uh, bring down to earth a, a, a debate which was much too abstract. One word about the the killer robots and then I'm silent. The killer robots, uh, the campaign to stop killer robots had an even more difficult task because there was no empiric material out there. They did preventive arms control. They just said we see a technological development which is threatening. We see that weapons get more and more autonomous. There is less and less pilots or, or, or soldiers in the, in the decision-making loop, and, and there is more and more software targeting, eventually even killing in future, or engaging targets, as we say. In, and, 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 and they made very strong the case by saying, okay, this is a, a trajectory we are on in, in weapon development, and we should stop that. And uh, that was, it was very powerful. It was much more difficult because they didn't have, you know, the, the hibakushas of Hiroshima. They just w looked into the future. They said, this is where we're heading and we should stop it. And I think both campaigns were very successful and very refreshing for uh, an, an arms control community or for a community which tends to be a little bit repetitive, well, the, the, the old males and so on who keep on saying the same things time and again. And so it's, I think it was a really good and refreshing moment for this debate. So you think that they actually managed to change the narrative about arms control and disarmament? Uh, not, not for all the decision makers, of course. But they, ch yes, they, uh, if if they they at least are now visible, and you know, a litmus test for the German security debate is, for example, the Munich Security Conference. There, you know, goes the mainstream security expert, scholar, whatsoever. And Icon was there. And, and you were there too, so. Uh, uh, but th that means, yes, we are witnessing uh, a, a slow change uh, of, of, of discourse. At least more progressive voices are heard uh, there. But, you know, uh, before we, we, we all start dancing about uh, that, that, that uh, disarmament is, is at the door, we should still say they are very strong forces of resistance still and, and who want to keep the status quo. They're still there. Uh, but, you know, there are some interesting openings. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so two weeks ago, we had a side event um, at the Munich Security Conference on feminist foreign policy. It was the first time that feminist foreign policy was discussed um, at the Munich Security Conference. It was still a side event, but we aim for the main stage uh, next year. Um, I know. <laughs> um, both of the campaigns are led by women, by explicit, outspoken feminists, and both campaigns use feminist narratives and f uh, feminist analysis. Do you think that's a coincidence? Yes and no, which is not really an answer, and I do <laughs> recognize that. So yes, a bit of a coincidence, but I think it rises from instinct. So an instinct that um, what we're currently doing is not working, which is what everyone else has said, so I'm not gonna you know, go into detail about it now, but there was a necessity to reframe 
right? And women make up 50% of the world. <laughs> so what was the first solution? Well, let's try and bring different people in. So the first intersection as you go down in terms of numbers is women. So the instinct is women. So I think, yeah, it was a coincidence in that sense. No, it wasn't a coincidence because we recognize that we need more perspectives. Now I'm just repeating my keynote at this point, but we do need more perspectives because not just because it's the nice thing to do, it is the nice thing to do, but not just because of that, but because there's plenty of analysis that proves that when you have a more diverse um, table, for instance, you're gonna get better ideas. And also feminist foreign policy challenges those the norms that are so fixed in place in security, because feminist foreign policy is applicable within lots of different sectors, right? But within security itself, which is so inherently stuck in this sort of silo, my country mindset, it, uh, feminist foreign policy comes in and disturbs the right people. It helps to, excuse my language, piss off the right people. And so we need to do that to reframe the debate. There needs to be enough social capital and I think that these institutions recognized that there was a gap for that and there was a necessity for that. Now, um, I think uh, it was mentioned right at the beginning that, you know, these, you know, instincts ex have existed for over 50 years. We just needed to mobilize, put them into a formal form and put them into an institutional form so that people can gather at one point and use their collective power to make an impact. And I think that's what these organizations did. So yes and no. Thank you. <laughs> and I think that's also one of the reasons why we actually obviously engaged in, in feminist foreign policy, but that we want to challenge also this feminist understanding or the gendered understanding of war and peace, that it's something brave and, and powerful to, to, to use violence where it's weak and um, feminine to be peaceful. So, yeah. Um, Sarah, um, as Georgia and also Gabriela mentioned, both campaigns highlight the, the humanitarian aspects of um, international arms trade. And you've, you've worked um, a lot on the interlinkages of small armed and light weapons and specifically gender-based violence. Why do you think it's so important to talk about the humanitarian consequences of arms? Thanks for that uh, question. Um, so I've been a humanitarian aid worker for over 20 years, and I've been to so many different emergencies. And the one thing that you see in all humanitarian emergencies is that you have a, um, the women are the ones who are taking care of the families, keeping the people together. They're looking after the elderly, they're looking after the, the children, they're looking after the sick. Because the men are either dead, uh, are fighting, or uh, in many places it's too dangerous for them to even to go out. Like the famous example of that is uh, firewood gathering, where the women would take the risk of rape because the men would be killed to do it. So they, they'd make a, a risk for that. So how does that relate to arms uh, disarmament um, beyond the, the very simple idea that if we had less weapons, there would be the war would be over sooner? Because it's greater than that. The more that we start looking at gender-based violence and humanitarian response, the more that we see that there's a knock-on effect and the more weapons that we have, the more gender-based violence we see. And it lasts way past the time of the actual conflict itself. The arms, uh, the, the arms flow is across borders. It impacts criminal gangs. It impacts human trafficking. We see more drug trade. All of this happening in the area right there, which means that uh, it's not as simple as the war is over. We sign a peace deal. There's never any women at the peace negotiating table. We sign a peace deal. The men decide decide what the punishment will be or how to carve up the territory, and then everyone just goes home and its business is normal. No, it doesn't happen like that. What happens instead is you have, uh, there continues to be a lot of violence in post-conflict areas, and it's almost all targeted towards women. In Sri Lanka, we saw after the, uh, the conflict with the, between the LTT and the um, Sri Lankan army, that there continued to be uh, armed incursions into um, houses, a harassment at checkpoints, women being forcibly um, sexually assaulted, a lot of continued violence. 
a lot of the men who uh, were fighters and come back have suffering from PTSD. They still have their weapons. Our demobilization programs uh, rarely get all of the guns. And the, the trauma, we're seeing there's a complete uh, correlation between intimate partner violence and conflict-related sexual violence with the proliferation of weapons in a humanitarian setting. So in uh, places where I, where I first started, my very first kind of uh, humanitarian uh, uh, deployment was into Liberia. So we had a lot of women in the uh, fighting forces there, and they were disarmed with the men as well. But they would never thought about what are these women going to do back in their societies, because their communities didn't accept them back either. So what did they do? They became sex workers for the UN peacekeepers and for the former combatants themselves. So um, in the Congo, we, what we see is there's a direct correlation. They've been doing some great studies at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative that even for men who have witnessed violence in the, in the uh, war are five times more likely to actually perpetrate intimate partner violence against their partner as well. So there's a direct correlation between the gender-based violence, the free flow of, of arms, and the lack of disarmament in the areas that we work. So. Thank you, yeah. And I mean, directly linked to the question of humanitarian consequences is the question of whose security we are talking about. And you touched upon it in your in your keynote, saying we are talking about security in silos. We're talking about the security of states. Yeah. And and why is it so important that we actually challenge this idea that secure states lead to secure people? So many reasons. Sorry, is this on? Yes, yeah. uh, multiple reasons. I'm going to touch on a few off the top of my head. The first is a very basic thing. A lot of people. Okay, so say a country says, you're now safe, okay? So I live in the United Kingdom. I don't feel very safe at the moment in the United Kingdom. I feel a bit disenfranchised, if I'm completely honest. Um, there's a lot of different types of security. Um, and again, Unidir have listed so many different types. But every time we focus on a, a nation or a block, we end up thinking about the same kind of security, which is military security, right? Because again, military security derives from norms of masculinity. And that is all centered on blocks, on defense, on sort of having your own space and defending it. Um, for a lot of people, they, they're not worried about getting bombed one day. And for a lot of people, they are. So people have lots of different ideas of what security means to them. For a lot of people, having constant energy sources is more important. Having safe food, safe water is more important. As we move into this, so I, one of my interests is space security, so we're gonna chat later, but um, I, you know, l space security is becoming more and more relevant. NATO finally named space as like a domain of war. That goes beyond any country. But as we push forward this narrative of countries, space will also become a space, spa space will also become a place, sorry, um, where countries can sort of go, this is my bit, this is my bit. Do we want to continue commodifying things that don't even belong to us? And then the other idea is that moving past this idea of my country versus your country, I think will help encourage moving past this idea of, again, nuclear deterrence. Nuclear deterrence is so my country versus your country, my block versus your block, that as, as, as long as we stay within security, remaining within that siloed mindset of countries, uh, national security rather than international security. Side note, nuclear weapons are often referred to as national security. I don't agree with that. It's part of foreign policy. It's part of military policy. It should be international security. But every country continues to call it national security, which is really interesting. Um, in any case, we need to move past that to break down the barriers and to break down this idea of nuclear deterrence because it will keep escalating. The more and more we pose national security as important, the more and more we start detracting from other issues like climate change, the more and more the attention starts getting diverted. So we really need to move past that. And Wilf has always rejected this theory of nuclear deterrence and specifically called out the gender discourse behind it. Can you can you explain this to us a bit more in detail? Um, well, for, hello. Well, first of all, deterrence is one of those words that I talked about before that no one really knows what it means. I mean, even in my own language, Swedish, of skräckning, I don't know what that means. So deterrence in English for me is even more, what's the word in German? Abschreckung. Do you know what that means? That means nothing. <laughs> it's just strange. What it actually means is 
we are building security on threatening to mass murder other civilians in other countries. That's what it means. But the terror sounds more exactly. <laughs> house, uh, what, what's the word? House clean. No, that's a, sw a Swedish word. What dogs, what you do with dogs so they don't trained. go, house trained, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so that deterrence is that. It's tra tra threatening to mass murder civilians. And that's what it is. Deterrence is also, um, I would probably say, one of the main issues with, with why we don't, why we still have nuclear weapons. Because deterrence was okayed. In the whole, when we actually uh, went down on nuclear weapons, um, when, when they actually disarmed the nuclear uh, warheads, they still were okayed with having some left because of deterrence. So deterrence is actually the theory that we have to keep on fighting to saying that this is not security. I don't feel safe when also logistically my country, Sweden, is then allied with the US. But if the US bombs Russia, we will be affected by the, uh, those nuclear weapons. Um, so it's very clear that deterrence does not give the security. Uh, and this is also like, Words are very much um, gendered. How we use words, we're being coded. When we're, when we're bo born and then we go through school of uh, the uh, socializing school that we go through and words have gender. So for example, a very good example is um, from Sweden. So 2017, when uh, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons was negotiated, a few months later, the Swedish then foreign minister, Margot Wall Wallström, announced that she, um, she, um, she had the intention to sign the treaty. And then the Swedish uh, uh, Minister of Defense went out and said that this is not a good idea. This will risk Swedish security. So except for them having a little bit of a battle in Swedish press, which was interesting, um, it was also interesting to see how the media presented the two versions. So Margot Wallström, the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, was um, discussed and presented as naive, dangerous, emotional, because she wanted to sign this treaty. On the other hand, Peter Hultqvist, our uh, uh, defense minister, he was reasonable. Uh, um, um, realistic, um, uh, responsible, uh, responsible, and so on. So these were the two ways. So this really shows the the the, the gendered version. Uh, the, gen the words have a gendered meaning, and how we present uh, different people. And it was just it just makes it even more clearer when it's a woman versus a man. It could have also been two men, but they uh, probably would have used the same kind of language to show. It's all the whole soft versus hard security that we were talking about before. Um, yeah. I stopped there. Yeah, and if you, I mean, if, as you just said, it's, it's really sad that someone who's advocating for disarmament is being considered as naive or as um, weak. She was also called an activist, which is uh, uh, what the security people, uh, that's the worst thing that you could be, an activist. Um, they're always, uh, just the other week, there was a security um, uh, op-ed, uh, or an open uh, written in Swedish newspaper about a, um, uh, from a security, from the traditional security perspective. And again, he said, we can't let, let this activist take uh, care of this armament. So it's a bad thing to be an activist. Oh, I think we at CFFP are really proud to be activists and, and try to bring the activism to the diplomacy. Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> Giorgio, for, 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 I would say, I don't know, 10 years or so, we thought that we've left the age of nuclear deterrence and the age of big man. But now we're here again. What happened? <laughs> That's a difficult question. Um, what happened? Um, let me just go back to the 90s when I was a student here in Berlin. The bestseller of that decade was called The End of History by Fukuyama. And what sounds a little bit bizarre today seemed totally plausible in the 90s. And, that, and what be, Fukuyama said, the um, Cold War is over and there is one model which prevailed our liberal democracy and market economy. And this will become the standard worldwide. We just have to do a little bit of, of trade and engagement with Russia, with China, with autocracies in the Middle East and so on. They will become like us. 
the world would become Western. And this was, I would say, a massive miscalculation because guess what? The ruling elites in Beijing, in Pyongyang, in Damascus, in Baghdad, and in Moscow had no intention to step back and give way to the new liberal elites in, in Russia, China, and whatsoever. They wanted to stay in power because that's what ruling elites usually do. Hardly in history you find um, a ruling elite which voluntarily gives up power to, to someone else. And therefore, um, this, what, what happened is that uh, China and Russia first, I mean, they, they, they engaged with the West, gained some strength, and after they felt sufficiently strong enough, they are starting to push back. And here we are now in a new world of great power rivalries. We rub our eyes and say, oh, this, uh, China and Russia didn't become Western liberal democracies uh, like we hoped in the Middle East. We don't have all these liberal uh, democracies as we hope. No, we have a world with non-Western uh, ruling elites who are pushing back, who, who, who want to survive. And um, that was, let's say, one, one part of the equation. The other part, of course, is that in the 90s, there was also another very toxic um, discourse in the US, which was the discourse of the unilateral moment. And uh, in, in translated into military, there was one leading uh, document which was called Full Spectrum Dominance. Uh, and, and that was the ambition of the West to say, well, now at the end of the Cold War, there is a little bit of confusion. We are very strong and we will now do a step forward in, in armament and try to dominate our possible competitors in all weapon categories from space to uh, missiles to cyber to electronic and so on. And uh, and so and they did they did so they spent hell of a lot of money for, for very modern weapons the United States and thought that their competitors starting from Russia and China would just stand idle and say wow they have uh, now uh, they they have a certain uh, advantage of course this this uh, antagonistic countries caught up they said okay if that's and the Chinese did it actually quite smartly. They didn't build as many nuclear weapons as the United States, but they said, okay, we, we are, will develop some key capabilities, military capabilities, in order to, to challenge the US. And so these were the two developments which were a little bit unfortunate. But back then in the 90s, when I was this young student of physics, by the way, here in Berlin, there was hope. I, I, I really believed that crap, that we will end up all as, a, as, as liberal democracies. And the only field where we're going to compete, I thought, is, is, is economy or sports. You know, that the competition would be who has the coolest phone, China, Russia, or the US, and all this military stuff would go. No, Fukuyama was wrong, and, and I was wrong, and, and most people in the 90s were wrong. History is full of surprises. <laughs> oh, but we, we work hard to bring back the hope, <laughs> <laughs> um, And I think it's really important what you also just said, and I think what you also mentioned in your keynote and, and Christina, is uh, the amount of money that is being spent on the development of, of weapons, where we could spend it on, on very useful human security issues. Um, Sarah, one of the terms that came up in the keynotes, but also in the discussion, is the toxic masculinity. Can you can you talk a bit about it, what it means, and why it is so important that we that we call it out? Yeah, yeah I mean, as the American on the panel, I think I could also say toxic masculinity, Donald Trump. Like, <laughs> then you get a very clear idea of what it means. I mean, I think one of the dangers when we talk about toxic masculinity is people feel like we're talking about all masculinities being toxic, or that it's only men who can also uh, exhibit toxic masculinities. Um, so basically, when we, and again, I, I appreciate when you said masculinity is not male behavior. It's about the gendered norms, the social uh, ways that uh, masculinity is performed. And I saw the other day online on Facebook that I thought was quite funny. It was a bumper sticker that somebody had. And it said, no seatbelts, we die like real men. <laughs> and I thought, oh, the poor men, they're not even allowed to want to survive a car accident. <laughs> you know? And to me, that's toxic masculinity. You're not allowed to sit next to your friend in the movie theater. You're not allowed to think that puppies are cute or kittens are 
cute. You're not allowed to like your children and play with them. You know, you have to be hard. You have to be a tough man. You have to be aggressive and you have to be violent. And so I was reading uh, something a couple of days ago as well that talked about drone warfare and um, how they're trying to balance the cowardliness of drone warfare. Because drone warfare has been sold to us as, well, we can go in and we can kill everyone, but we won't get killed. Isn't that great? You know, but then they're like, well, wait a minute. Real men want to join the military and they want to be tough and they want to go out and they want to kill people. And so we got these guys, you know, playing video games and flying drones away. So the rise of the geek warrior. So to recreate this toxic masculinity, this warrior ethos of the being hard and tough and cool. So some of the guys have named their drones the Sky Rapist. So that's like the... the Toxic masculinity to a T. It has to be about dominating. It has to be about penetrating the airspace. It has to be about making everyone else submit. There is no room in there for softness, for compromise, for emotion. You know, no men have emotions. Their emotions are anger and stoicness. They're only allowed to show stoicism. So this, this toxic masculinity, which I feel rising in my country, uh, the US, very strongly, um, you know, if you look even just at our politicians, and I'm a child of the 80s even, so I'm even older than you, but uh, in the 80s, we were ducking and covering under our, our uh, chairs in South Carolina. And, uh, you know, what passed for a right-wing person in the 80s in, in the United States would now be Bernie Sanders, like a socialist. It's like, I was like, have you met any real socialists? Like, you know, so it's like we've gotten harder and more obsessed with the military to get on the airplanes in America. The first people that they allow on is business class corporations first, right? And then it's our troops, our troops, you know, and it's all about, oh, we love our troops, but we don't love them when they're injured or when they have PTSD or when they need help. And that's the toxic masculinity that I see. It's that you're only a real man when you're tough, when you're dominating, and when you're killing. And anyone else who doesn't support that is weak and othered, and we can attack them. You talked about an, uh, activists, right? The one that I hate is when you're labeled a social justice warrior. Like, that's a bad thing, that you care about social justice. And it's not just men who are you know, guilty of toxic masculinity. There was just recently in Australia, uh, a woman and her three children were killed because the husband jumped in the car, poured gasoline on all of them, set them on fire, and then killed himself to avoid being held accountable for this. And who was one of his first defenders? It was a woman who said, well, we don't know what she did to push him that far. So, like, let's not confuse, you know, men equal toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity is our rape culture. It's our culture that we're working in, and it's the language that people use. It's the, the macho posturing, you know, where Donald Trump could not wait to start a space force. Oh, my God, he gets to design his own military force, and I bet all he worked on was the uniforms. You know, that's the only thing he's concerned about. But it's this idea that harder, meaner, faster, bigger, you know, my, my button is bigger than your button, I love that name, is uh, the way to go. And it's something that we have to counterbalance. And we have to counterbalance it by, one, recognizing that it's not just male and female as well. You know, there are people of non-binary people. There are people, there are different men and different women. And there's so many different masculinities and femininities. And where are our voices? So bringing people in, from different perspectives and different approaches to push back against this dominant uh, toxic masculinity. I mean, times are hard right now in the gender equality world. The backlash against our progressiveness in the 90s is coming at us hard. Just to say the word gender in Bulgaria, for instance, you know, they're like burning effigies of Judith Butler. They don't probably even know what Judith Butler has written about. But the word gender, I wasn't allowed to use it at a recent training I was doing there with interpreters. We had to just say sexual violence. That was less offensive than the word gender-based violence. Because this term gender has come to mean soft and feminist and women. Whereas, you know, security is tough and hard and masculine. So, to me, that is what toxic masculinity is. Thank you. Um, and I think you also touched upon two, two arguments that we as a member of the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots are trying to, to counter. And one is that 
because uh, one of the arguments that is being used in favor of fully autonomous weapons is that they can kill better because they don't get tired, they don't get angry. And we try to tell us that, that, that this is not a good thing. Yeah. And also we try to tell us the idea that they cannot rape. So we would say, and I think that's based on obviously all the work that Wolf has been doing, that yes, they can be programmed to rape. And it also really misunderstands what rape is. Rape is not about sexual lust, about a machine having lust. It's about power and violation and abusing power and using your power for that. So of course a machine can rape. I mean, anyone who's been through uh, airport security and been selected for a pat down, I was selected in January when I was flying through the US and uh, you know, that was a very intimate pat down instructed by a machine. So the idea that somehow, you know, if we turn everything over to the machines, but we, we've seen already that uh, the, the huge gender biases in uh, artificial intelligence and in the programming. Who's doing the programming? I think the last thing I saw was that it's only 12% of programmers are women. So who is programming? Why doesn't Siri recognize women's voices as well as it does? Why doesn't facial recognition recognize people of color's faces? Why is Alexa a woman? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so this idea that it will make it safer and better, I mean, and who do you hold accountable if your drone goes wrong? You know, it's, we have courts of law to uh, uphold international humanitarian law and international human rights law. And who would we be holding accountable for that? So the idea that, that we take away the human decision making uh, because we trust in the code. I can't even trust you know, Amazon to get my window of time right to deliver my materials to my house. And we're gonna turn over the power to something like that is quite frightening. Yeah, to, to decide of whether or not to kill other human beings, yeah. And then also, I'm sorry to no. jump in, but I'm getting like riled up. Um, you know, it's all also all about target selection and who is a legitimate target. And it's almost always young men. Because by default, if you're a young man in a war zone, then you're a potential uh, you know, combatant, and then it's okay. And so when they have these drone strikes and such, they always are trying to target and find the time when it's all the men are together, et cetera. Because there's an inherent bias assuming that man equals perpetrator, therefore we, you know, we're allowed to kill them. Yeah, they're combined with a, with a racial biased um, program that's yeah. just really, really dangerous. Yeah. Um, Gabriela is the campaign to stop uh, killer robots is hugely supported by um, countries in the global south. And I think that has also something to do with some of the issues that we just talked about, this huge um, power inequality that they face in, a, in, the, in the multilateral system. Um, w what kind of fears do they express when you work with them or you talk to them? Well, um, so WILP uh, exists in 50 countries uh, and one of my main uh, uh, information source is my colleagues around the world and um, what's very clear and I think that's also the answer uh, to this question why the global south is so engaged in both the campaign to stop killer robot but also I can and a lot of other uh, disarmament campaigns that are out there is that they have experience from war and conflict they are living it now or they're living in post-conflict situations they know what war looks like um, the countries that are developing these uh, these weapons have not been in war for a long time. Uh, and they're also developing these countries, like we've talked about um, before on the panel, to uphold a power. I think a lot of uh, the countries in the Global South, so they know what, it, what war, the face of war, what it looks like. Um, I think also that they... Um, uh, they also uh, challenge... They have a lot of other challenges that we have as well in the north, but maybe not as extreme. They have the fight on poverty. They have uh, um, disease control uh, problems and so on. So they really know what the, the, the real security is and what it is not. They need resources. They need investments in things that are killing people now, uh, that are uh, destroying societies now. Uh, and they do not need... These weapons will not make them safer. So I think a lot of... Um, a lot of the global south, uh, of course, it's also the power structure thing that you talked about, that um, it's the global north holding them hostage a bit with this kind of militarized security. But it's also that they actually know what security is and isn't. Uh, and that's why they're engaging in these kind of uh, campaigns.
Yeah, and I mean, if we look at who is actually at the moment hindering or preventing um, an international legally banned treaty, it's mainly the US and Russia, who are obviously also dominating the international um, order. Yeah. I mean, it's um, disarmament has so much to do with feminism, but it has also so much to do with an uh, anti-colonialism. Um, if we look at the uh, nuclear ban treaty, for example, we know that why not as many as we would have wished for, African countries, for example, have signed or ratified, is because France, the UK, and the US have threatened, they wouldn't say the word threaten, these, their former colonies to say, if you sign this treaty, we might not give you aid. We might not do this. So it's also a whole, it's the, um, there's so much an, uh, colonialism still in this, in this field of work that is and uh, power still working and not working. Um, and, and Georgia, in this international system, hopes were high, now we're talking again about hope, <laughs> but hopes were high that Germany and Sweden would take on leading roles in, in supporting the two bans. So specifically Sweden, as you, you mentioned, with, with the nuclear ban treaty, and Germany um, with regard to the, to the um, preemptive ban on fully autonomous weapons. But nothing has happened so far. Both of them just have not um, joined either campaign. Um, but we also see other European countries, for example, Austria, who have endorsed both um, campaigns. Why do you think it's so difficult for Germany and Sweden? Well, for Sweden, I think Gabriela can answer the question better. For Germany, I think um, it's more difficult because Germany does not like to act unilaterally. Germany is a NATO ally and NATO defines itself as a nuclear alliance. Germany is an EU member state where we had two nuclear power states until the UK left us. Now we have one nuclear power state, but still we have countries like France who have uh, quite ambitions in the military use of artificial intelligence. And to, to cut a long story short, Germany is in the international scene, not, not such a revolutionary country as we as NGOs would like it to be. Germany is the typical bridge builder. And this has even some historical reasons. Germany has a certain past and th therefore Germans don't want to rock the boat too much. They want to build bridges to all sides. Uh, so that they have this image of nice, engaged international citizens with good relations with big powers, good relations with the global south. And therefore, that, that's the major thrust of German uh, foreign policy, especially in the disarmament camp, bridge building. Um, and that, that's what they're doing currently. I mean, they, in, in, the, in the campaign to stop killer robots, they see that the Global South wants, wants a ban, and, and, and many countries not really engaged in, in the military use of artificial intelligence. But those, the, the haves, those countries who are using artificial intelligence uh, in, in their militaries, they don't want a ban at this moment. They are very ambivalent. And what Germany then, uh, the, the German approach is then they say, we try to somehow engage them uh, uh, and, and, and try to commit them that they at least commit in the international scene not to develop killer robots or lethal autonomous weapon systems. They will not sign a, a, an international treaty, but that's the, the German approach. They say, we, we, have, we want a dialogue with France, with the US, with um, Russia, China, and want somehow to commit them to, to some kind of soft law to declare publicly that they won't develop these weapons. It's a relatively low barrier, but you know, at least the, you, you might say they, they might suffer this country's reputational damage if they still do so. It's, I think as, as a strategy, it's, um, it's defensible. It's defensible. I mean, for NGO, NGOs suffer because they, of course, said you should prohibit these weapons. They are inhumane. They are, um, killer robots are not compatible with international humanitarian law. Um, but, you know, the Germans probably say if we prohibit, we alienate France, we alienate all these countries, and we want to do this bridge building because that's part of the German foreign policy DNA for good or for bad. Do you want to add for Sweden? And just for the record, we invited representatives from both Germany and Sweden to join today's discussion, but they have not accepted our invitation. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, why Sweden? I mean, it's the same reason why, why Sweden didn't sign is because the U.S. told them not to. So that's why Sweden didn't sign the, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Um, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> I think you just answered it. Yeah, so. okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and um, just two more questions, maybe before we open up uh, the question uh, for, for uh, questions from the floor. Do you think we'll ever leave this international order where power equals military power, and where states who don't have a huge military will have something to say at the international order? Okay. So so far, we've been in this discussion. We talked about nuclear weapons. So I'm just going to use that as a lens to talk about this. I've tried really hard to avoid jargon this evening, but I am going to slip into it and I'm really sorry um, if I do. So we've touched on a lot of the complexities um, in the last 90 seconds, right? We've, we've already said Sweden isn't signing it because the US said not to. There are power structures and there are systemic and symbolic incentives for those power structures to continue to exist. Yeah? So... The P5 countries, the United Nations uh, Security Council, all have nuclear weapons, right? Whether that's a coincidence or not, in my opinion, it's not, but you can hold your own opinion. Um, the fact is that nuclear weapons equals being in positions of power and being in positions to make big decisions about international relations. While these incentives continue to exist, and continue to be taken, you know, quite seriously, I think it's going to be very hard. Now, there, there are mechanisms in place to challenge this. I hoped that when the US started developing what they called low-yield nuclear weapons, that the NPT mechanism would step in and say, yo, like, this is not on. That has not happened, um, which is worrying. Um, so the one sort of international treaty that we have that, as many countries as possible are signed into. Let's, we can talk about the colonial part of that another time. India and Pakistan are not part of it. That's a whole other thing. But um, the fact that the one mechanism that is meant to hold countries accountable and has three pillars, uh, the two of which that are relevant here are deterrence and disarmament. Um, the fact that the disarmament angle is being sort of shoved aside and continued to be is very worrying. It's incredibly worrying, especially given that the review conference is happening in two months and that there's been lots of talk about disarmament and going into the review conference. I am personally, and don't take this as my institutional opinion, but I'm tired of going to all of these NPT pre-events where they talk about how committed they are. When you go back and look four years ago to the minutes of the same meetings and they say exactly the same thing, there needs to be radical change we need to start questioning the norms and values that we assign to countries that have nuclear weapons. All those years ago, nuclear weapons were a sign of scientific and technological integrity and development and capability. And you were like, yeah, you know, go you. You have an amazing nuclear weapons program. But all these countries got nuclear weapons for different reasons. India got nuclear weapons for a different reason to the US, right? So as soon as we... But while we continue to treat nuclear weapons as sort of a homogenous marker of power, we're not actually challenging the real reason why countries have them and challenging the real ways in which we can get rid of them. So I think there needs to be a radical shift. And in my opinion, we need to be framing more and more discussions with a feminist lens because nothing else has worked bluntly speaking. Um, and I think we need to challenge the power structures that exist, both symbolic and Uh, systemic that keep uh, nuclear weapons being incentivized to countries because the power relations are very complicated. They're very, very complicated and they continue to grow. I mean, the fact that the US can, you know, say we won't continue to support you if you sign this treaty to a country that has its own government and her own decision-making uh, people is really messed up. And, and it's really masculine. It's a power thing. It's a, it's a control thing. So there's a lot that needs to be challenged. And I think we're moving in the right direction, but it all comes from the grassroots at the moment. Um, and what we need to do is continue to push forward. It will take time, but get these grassroots ideas into the rooms where the final decisions are made. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> we're trying to do so, yeah. <laughs> I, I want to end the, 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 our discussion with a question of bringing the, the violence of the international level to the domestic level. And you've just um, written a, a piece, which will be published, I think, in two weeks, on the interlinkages of, the, of violence at the international level and, the, and violence at the domestic level. And you've already touched upon it in the beginning, but why is it so important to make these interlinkages? Well, I just want to use as an example um, the looking at what happens to, to the guns because the guys in the military want the newest and the brightest and the best guns, right? So what do they do with their old guns? Well, in the U.S., they give them to the police forces throughout uh, our communities. We now have uh, what used to be your friendly neighborhood cop walking around with like an armored vehicle with like, you know, body armor and tactical this and that and all of these weapons. And they're rolling around on the streets and busting down, you know, like uh, illegal immigrants who are just minding their own business, rolling in like they're going into Fallujah in full battle gear. And what, what happens to these weapons, right? We know when there's a gun in the house and if there's violence in the house, then there's, that gun is going to be used. And who's going to receive that weapon? It's going to be against women. There was a study in the U.S. I still haven't seen, and I would love to see other countries' data on this, but that... Um, there's a very high percentage of police officers who are also perpetrators of domestic violence. And they, the skills that make you a very good police officer, like being able to do surveillance and being able to understand the mindset to control and such, make you a very good perpetrator of domestic violence as well. And so the uh, roll down, what we see, you know, as we are putting more and more money into international weapons, into militarizing all of the different states. We're seeing that in our civilian world and framework as well. We're seeing less and less money for social programs that impact women and children. We're seeing almost, you know, almost no money on nonviolent education in schools. Right? Everything is being funneled into the military and funneled into this extremely toxic, masculine, uh, violent world that we're coming into. So the linkages to me are very clear. I see uh, our failure to disarm and demobilize and bring things down a bit at the international level is being played out in our domestic sphere and in, in our individual houses even. So, so they're, they're, they're clear. Um, it's the grassroots I think will save us, you know? <laughs> like uh, uh, you talking about the 90s is making me think about the 80s uh, when I was a student. And we weren't, uh, I mean, we were fighting against apartheid and we were fighting against nuclear weapons. But what I see now with the students and the young people now is fighting on a gendered level as well to recognize that it's not just binary, uh, you know, male versus female and to, and to link arms between all of these different levels and to take a really intersectional feminism and to bring the voices of women of color to the front and for it no longer just to be about, uh, you know, what the old white men have to say. So I feel like there, I do feel hopeful, you know. Uh, I'm, I got my ballot in the mail yesterday for the South Carolina Democratic primary. Uh, so I can, I'm debating between Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, but <laughs> you can lobby me afterwards, whatever you like. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I feel like there is a, a shift in a movement. We've seen the backlash come down hard on gender, um, but I think we're starting to push back. And I think that, I hope that there will be some change soon. I feel cautiously optimistic. Can I, um, Wolf did a, a, a study a few years ago and we looked at um, 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 called, uh, centers that, uh, that uh, take care of women that have been domestically abused. Uh, and I think it was only Austria, uh, Australia that actually recorded and asked the question if a gun had been involved in the in the violence. Uh, and the same the numbers there showed exactly what you're saying. But that's the only country, this was a few years back, so maybe it changed, but that was the only country that actually had this question asked in one, in a center. Um, so even, even in these kind of issues, it's still not linked. Um, thank you, and also for giving us some hope on how we can move forward. And now it's it's your time. If you have a question or a comment, um, just raise your hand. I think we have a microphone around here. Yeah. And if you can, if you want to, please do say who you are and who you work for and who you ask the question to. Hello. Um, 
my name is Kata Kotz, and um, I have worked some in Mexico and recently moved to Berlin in the last year and two years so far. Um, my question is related, and it's kind of directed at, excuse me if I mispronounce your name, Anurata? And um, Sarah, um, but if there's an interjection, I'm also curious to hear what other people say. And this has been covered to some degree, but I'm curious to hear more detail about methods and procedure. Um, when considering situations such as gender violence and the representation of the global South in the feminist discussions that we have just covered and the relationship between international um, security and domestic security, both on the ground in people's homes, but also um, in terms of civil protections. What are some of the parameters that could be used in order to both increase representation um, and the disparity between that representation currently, um, both to further represent the global south and people's voices who aren't being heard? Uh, specifically also readdressing the question of um, killer robots. I think something that wasn't said but was implied is not only that the places that are protesting killer robots and are for that protest are not only places that have experienced war long term but would be also the targets of those killer robots. Um, so this question is related to maybe addressing further methodologies because um, I was also last week at the Hertie School for the opening of the Forum for Fundamental Rights. And it was an interesting question as well regarding the way things are titled because the, it was a conversation about fundamental rights and the audience was far more full. There are about three times as many people here. Um, and the panel was all women except for the moderator. Um, and it was specifically targeting law and questions of uh, legislation and court decisions. Uh, but the representation in the audience was all ages, <laughs> all genders, um, and so this is also an interesting thing. But Patricia Sellers uh, spoke to also as a possible solution, offering, and I'm offering this as well as part of the methodologies, but also to hear more, um, that we need to focus also on some of the wins. She is the uh, gender advisor to the prosecution office for the International C Criminal Court. And she was also saying that we need to focus on changing the language and not letting uh, right-wing um, organizations that are using and only addressing the language through the language that is being used by the right wing. So gender ideology is not a thing and not using that language. But gender is part of the larger conversation on fund fundamental rights and the things that we need to be addressing. And also considering what's happening, for example, in Mexico today, where um, the corruption cannot even be addressed because on the ground people do not have civil protection. So like today, the national strikes that are being called by the women on the ground speaking out against feminicides. How do we address things when people can't actually have just resource um, scarcity being addressed and overall, yeah. May we take one more question um, and then Anna? Okay, th thank you, Nina, for the opportunity to ask a question. My name is Anna von Gall. I'm currently working with Greenpeace on peace and disarmament. Both of me and my colleague, we are working on nuclear disarmament and disarmament at Greenpeace at the moment. I wanted to go back a little bit on the national level and to share some experience I had within the last weeks and ask for you, um, particular Gabriel, for your idea or what you th what you think, what kind of change Sweden is facing. I would like to draw on the arms trade treaty, so arms control, a little bit further away from a nuclear disarmament, but the ATT says that you should do, do when granting licenses, do a risk assessment on gender-based violence. The German government is very reluctant to do it, um, and there has been an um, export control day of the government um, last week, and it was complete gender-blind. Um, there was just one female moderator. It was two days, 500 participants. It was one male moderator and one female um, panelist. She was she's heading um, the section on um, export control at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We got the possibility to discuss, and then I had I challenged uh, the the way how licenses of arms has are granted. 
and that uh, gender-based violence is not, re it's not very clear how gender-based violence is checked. And the answer is, first of all, um, gender-based violence is somehow checked to their um, through the way they check human rights violations. Then they say, you know, there's a missing disaggregated data on gender-based violence, that's, we, that's why we can't use it. And last but not least, you know, we don't even get to the point of gender-based violence because we just stop selling arms due to several other reasons. So actually, I get the impression, okay, now we're here, how when we, like we were discussing gender-based violence and international criminal law 20 years ago, if you don't ask the questions, you don't neither get the disaggregated data, nor you get the information on, on gender-based violence. So my question would be, if you have a good idea <laughs> how to challenge it, <laughs> because whoever I ask, no one has like um, example for good practices, how um, the countries are really included in their in their process of granting licenses, and if you have somewhere a recommend policy recommendation. Who wants to go first? Do you want to answer the question on? Uh, participation, language, and resources. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I was going to, let's start the, yeah. So that was a really detailed question. There were a lot <laughs> of layers there. I'm not going to be able to address them all, but perhaps later on, come and chat, and we can sort of break down what you were talking about. Um, the things that I picked out of them were semiotics, semantics, language, symbolism, um, the levels at which we discuss the problems, um, fear, anonymizing um, incidents, um, methodologies, which we can touch on briefly, um, and countries that don't like talking about gender. So starting from the beginning, um, in every type of war technology or every type of terror, uh, technology or whatever, there are certain languages um, that are used. There are certain words that are used. Um, so, so for instance, there's this thing called nuke speak, right? So a very small echelon of countries use very technical and special language to talk about nuclear weapons and alienate everyone else. Um, and this is in, in lots of different types of uh, security fields. Uh, so the first question is, how do we challenge the language surrounding these technologies? How do we challenge the way that we talk about them and stop glamorizing them a little bit? Um, or stop talking about them in such an aggressive way and start talking about them actually as neutral instruments that we need to dismantle. Um, there are lots of different theorists out there that I can only name one off the top of my head um, that would be relevant to what you're talking about. Her name's Mary Caldor um, at LSC. She, she was amazing. She wrote this paper on something called security cultures. So there are four different security cultures. Um, one is the traditional sort of war. The other is the war on terror. And then there's this other thing called um, new wars. So... Uh, or liberal peace, and it's talking about issues that aren't inherently uh, military. And it talks about things such as human rights issues, uh, international law, uh, and looks at the wars or the debates that are happening and helps to categorize countries into different echelons. And it, that helps the analysis a little bit. So if you're interested in doing sort of an analysis of the different types of security or peace issues that, that different people face, um, especially from a gendered lens, then I think that that's a really good starting point. Um, there's lots of different reading out there as well. Carol Cohn is a really good example. Um, but yeah, so in terms of tying in the questions about language, structures, and methodology, I think that that's a really good starting point. Um, the other issue is um, where do you start to dismantle the the points that were the nodes at which? So I, I come from a systems theory um, background in my master's training, and so you look at things as interrelated rather than as in individual things, which is why I hate looking at security as like a little <laughs> bubble of its own because it's related to lots of different fields. Um, but you have to look at the system and dismantle it and look at where the blockages are in terms of talking about violence or in talking about discrimination. 
And you'll see that it happens at lots of different levels. So again, you're talking about shifting the culture within different parts of a system at different levels of a system. So another methodology you could use is systems theory. So have a look at systems theory of innovation. Um, Chris Freeman is a really good author on it at the national level. Um, and act and network theory, which is a bit older, but it's a really good start point and social constructivism, which I'm sure you're aware of. Um, and then the other thing is, which is a really blatant point, but you see this. So I um, also chair an organization called UK SADS, which is UK Students for the Exploration and Development of Space. Um, we've been around for 31 years and we've been focusing on the last two years on how diversity and inclusion will help the UK space sector. Um, and some countries really don't like talking about diversity and inclusion because it really challenges their inherent sort of masculine um, identity and power. So looking at how we can include them by using different languages, also a different way of doing it, but I'll pass it on. <laughs> yeah, so I was thinking about uh, your question as well, um, about uh, what are methods that we could use. And what I'm seeing that seems to be working, and I'm gonna go back to the humanitarian world. Um, we've had a dirty little secret in the humanitarian world for a long time, that you're much more likely to get raped or sexually abused by your coworker than you are by a stranger at a checkpoint or et cetera. And no one has ever talked about that. We always talk about, you know, we pass like, you know, messages to each other, oh, don't be alone with him in the room, et cetera. And that's shifting and that's changing. And the Me Too movement Movement has helped with that. And by the way, shout out, Harvey Weinstein was found guilty today. So one victory. <laughs> so what we're doing now is we're talking about security. We've always had security officers in our humanitarian settings. And these are usually former military, almost always men. And what they do is they get really turned on by the idea about threat, you know, alerts and about, you know, code red and restricting your movement. Their favorite thing to do to protect you is to restrict your movement, which means they restrict you into a guest house with these perpetrators that you're deployed with, which does not improve your security. So we're taking back the language of security and we're saying, who's gonna keep us safe from there? So there's more and more kind of women's groups coming together. There's on the on the internet, we have this space, this humanitarian women's network. There's It started out with four women drinking wine in Guinea complaining about how no one would investigate the sexual harassment claims. And then they found a loophole and they started investigating them themselves. And so holding people accountable, supporting each other, building networks across just the, you know, the small little bubble that you're in. And it also makes me think as well about in, um, and I'm sorry to use always American examples and we're in the election fever, I'm like very focused right now. But, uh, you know, we're moving outside of our kind of normal political systems, right? You know, who's taking the lead on sanctuaries for immigrants and who's taking the lead on climate change? It's cities. It's not the federal government. It's not the state government. And we no longer can rely upon our federal government to hold the banner and to move forward in a progressive way. So different cities are doing it and taking and seizing that control. If you look at like uh, the state of California, it has more money and power than most countries in this world. And it's gonna push forward an agenda on demilitarization. So going outside of our kind of top-down political systems and doing a much more grassroots movement and finding unlikely allies in 2000, um, I was a part of the Jubilee uh, 2000 movement, which was about debt relief. And it was about canceling structural adjustment through the World Bank. And we had a really interesting and diverse group. It was religious organizations, it was unions, and it was progressives. And you know, we were really starting to make a difference with the World Trade Organization talks, and like we were really making something. Then September 11th happened, which allowed the governments and the powers that be to seize the narrative and make it all about security again. Forcing us to prove our loyalty and our nationalism by getting in lockstep behind them and forgetting about all of these things we had. I feel like it's shifting back again. And we're seeing these coalitions of people who didn't necessarily have things in common before standing up and fighting. The National Rifle Association, the NRA in the US is losing power actually. You can't tell that by the media in general, 
but you can tell it by the fact they've had to close down a lot of their initiatives, like the NRA TV and such, because people have been pushing back and refusing to buy in stores, having targeted boycotts. I belong to something called the Sleeping Giants on Facebook, where if they, uh, you know, they say, oh, you you know, this company is advertising on Tucker Carlson's show on Fox News. Is that where you want your money to go? Do they even know that they're advertising? So we write them letters and we complain. It's good old grassroots networking and organizing. And it's taking the voices of the people and not just waiting for your elected representatives who, you know, are only taking lunches with the lobbyists to represent you, but forcing the representation yourself. So I think that, I mean, the election of Donald Trump was terrible for the whole world. I was asked to speak on a panel right afterwards about what will be the impact on women. And it was all I could do not to cry while I was up there on stage. But what I didn't see, and which is why we have to be optimistic again, is the groundswell of people who stopped paying attention because it didn't seem that important and it didn't impact them that much, who are now paying attention and running for office and finding coalitions and, and fighting back. And I think that's what we have to keep our eyes on and that's what we have to focus on because that's where the power is and we have seen it change. Do you want to go for the ATT question? Yeah. Um, well, the ATT, the Arms Trade Treaty, is uh, was negotiated a few years back. Um, it's a um, it's a treaty, international treaty. It's to put it simple, it's a list of uh, of when you cannot uh, sell weapons to another country. So if you know they're going to uh, go to um, violating human rights or t uh, so on, you can't do it. So there's a list of, of things that you, when you can't do it. And one of those lists is gender-based violence, when you know that the weapons are going to go and be used uh, for gender-based violence. And it was, um, it was civil society in the room that pushed, really pushed for this. And it's the first international treaty that, act, the first international arms control treaty that actually uh, highlights that there is a linkage between the two, between arms and gender-based violence. Um, I might also say, I always think that people know this, but uh, Sweden is not a good country <laughs> when it comes to arms and military. We're a highly military country. Uh, we're very similar to Germany in that case and what you said about Germany. And Sweden is also per capita one of the biggest arms exporters in the world. And about 40% of the weapons that they sell, I'm not part of it. Well, actually, they're using my tax money, so I am. But <laughs> I did not approve it. Um, 40% goes to uh, countries that are uh, in some sort of conflict or that violates uh, human rights, and particularly women's rights, all the time. Um, so um, Sweden sees itself as a, one of the champions that helped push for this gender-based violence criteria in the ATT, but they have... Uh, as of yet, not implemented it. So we meet them. Um, we meet the, meet the authority that uh, gives the licenses for the Swedish licenses for to sell arms, uh, maybe twice a year. And this is one of the questions I continually ask. Um, and they they say pretty much what you said. Well, we cover that with human rights, or we cover that it doesn't even get that far. Uh, but then when I continue asking follow up questions, I also get answers like, well, we don't really know what a gen analysis is. Um, they also don't know, because we're in co coalition with uh, Save the Children Sweden, uh, trying to get Sweden to stop exporting uh, arms to the um, warring parties of Yemen. Sweden right now sells uh, weapons to four countries that are uh, currently um, in Yemen fighting. Uh, so Save the Children has joined in uh, and they also asked about the the child perspective, and they had no idea that there was a child perspective. Um, so these things are not uh, implemented by Sweden. Um, but we keep on, we have a list of things that we, uh, we're, we want to be part of the assessment that they do, this authority does. So the Swedish law is very, um, it's non-transparent, so we can't see what the final product is, why this license was accepted or why this license was not accepted. But the Swedish law is pretty much that you're, you're supposed to balance national security or security and in the other, uh, uh, towards human rights. You're supposed to be, do a balance. And if human rights wins, you don't sell the arms. If, it's more, if, if there's stronger national or security uh, positive things, you sell the arms. But this is completely untransparent, so we don't know uh, how these processes work. Uh, but what we're trying to do is that in this process, 
um, the authorities should, for example, look on the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, the 1325 Security Council Resolution, to look at what the reception, recip, recipient country, how they work, how their military works on 1325, for example, to look at the CEDA committee. Uh, CEDA, um, CEDA is the, uh, one of these that when you... Yeah, you use the, um, the shorter version so much so you forget what the actual word is. Uh, so we tried to get Sweden to at least put these things in the assessment to start there. Um, and then obviously also uh, trying to... Uh, Sweden, as you might all know, has a feminist foreign policy. Um, it's more of a feminist aid policy. Uh, has uh, The feminist uh, thing has not gotten into the security policies yet. Um, uh, so we've tried very hard to just try to highlight that the arms trade, the Swedish arms trade has a lot to do with feminist foreign policy and it's taken up until now. So what is it for six years to them, for them to maybe, maybe a little bit see that there's a linkage. Um, in Swedish, this Sweden arms cell is also very high tech. So it's a lot of, um, surveillance systems and, and um, now I can't uh, come up with the English words, but it's not a lot of small light weapons, for example. So for Swedish law to kick in for the gender-based violence criteria, we kind of have to prove how you use a fighter jet to beat a woman in the head. That's pretty much, then they would stop. But that's very difficult to see, the direct, direct violence. There's so much other violence that are not direct, uh, but that the law does not um, give that opportunity. There were questions over there. Thank you. It's the last round of questions, so if you want to raise your hand. <laughs> Thank you. So my name is Liam Barguti, and I'm Palestinian, and I've been in Berlin for the last three years, and I work for Bada'il, which is a Syrian grassroots NGO working on this building, nonviolence, human rights, and um, inside Syria. So my question was actually, it's not really related to that, but more focusing on masculinities and discrimination, and especially what I call it, the trickle-down armament, as I call it, um, especially in the case of Palestine. Um, I've done research before, especially with uh, young men, and one of one of the things that was interesting that I found with the masculinities, it is there is kind of driving away from this toxic masculinity idea of I need to be armed, I need to go fight, I need to shoot people. So there is a bit of that happening from the young people. But one of the things that was interesting is dealing with the foreign military powers. Um, especially when they practice nonviolence, often a lot of the anecdotes that I've heard, and I know there's research also to support this, is that um, a lot of the times the Israeli military actually attacks the women in a way to kind of, I don't want to use the word emasculate, but to kind of disrupt the masculinities that a lot of Palestinian men hold and to and a lot, of, a lot of the unaffected effect, or maybe it was intentional, is that in these kind of villages and towns that do practice nonviolent demonstrations, but end up getting attacked by the army, is that they then kind of restrict the movement of the women and so on. Then it's like, you can't go to a demonstration anymore. It's too dangerous for you and so on. So there's this kind of aspect that I was wondering that is there a discussion in the humanitarian uh, humanitarians? Is there a discussion also in the security and foreign policy? Because also Israel is one of the biggest recipients of military aid. Should we be having a discussion about military aid in general rather than just disarmament of nuclears? Because from my perspective, and I'm sure a lot of people's perspective, especially in Palestine, is that giving military aid or security aid for the Palestinian Authority it's not really actually doing much. It's just, it's kind of putting a Band-Aid over a broken car or something like that. It doesn't actually bring about a more secure future for all. So I was wondering also, is there a discussion about that? Are we discussing military aids in general? Thank you. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, I'm Julia, currently working for the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. And I have a question concerning um, the 85% females in the room, because every time I go on feminist or gender-related um, events, it's like this. There are 85% females in the room, and I think we need to get men involved in this discussion, because if not, we don't have a chance to get this a really big thing. And I was wondering, what would you all think? How can we do that? How can we relate to more men? Because yes, we are 50% of the world, and with the queer folks even more, but uh, we need probably more than 50% to do it. Right here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anna. I've been with uh, Wilf in here in Germany and in Costa Rica. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that you also talked a bit about um, like global power structures and the history and interconnections with colonialism. But I have what I think is a comment and a question. I hope it comes out eloquently as well. Um, which is, I think, also in the conversation here, that it has been somewhat coded in the language that has been used in reference to the global south, rather than racialized people. Um, and how, for example, the question of nuclear weapons and who is a legitimate holder of nuclear weapons is also racialized. Um, and like the best example is South Africa, where like a um, minority rule, like transition of power would probably not have taken place or in the way that it did if there had not been a voluntary disarmament of nuclear weapons in South Africa before that transition. Um, so I just kind of wanted to comment on that, that that has also been coded in a conversation here and ask about the ways that maybe a conversation on racial justice in relationship to security has taken place or how you've observed it in different spaces and contexts. Thank you. Is there another question? OK. Um, do you want to answer the question about Palestine and masculinities and military aid? Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> um, so actually, I've just spent the past year doing research on sexual violence against men and boys and people of sexual and gender minorities. And one of the things that I've found is that, you know, we've, we've very much fallen into this thing where, you know, women are weak and vulnerable and men are strong and protect them. And it, sexual violence doesn't happen against men. But that's not true. And the more we're seeing, I would say in the last two or three years, we're really seeing a big shift to actually understanding that men are very vulnerable to sexual violence as well, particularly forced witnessing, which is something, which is kind of what you're describing as well, where an attack on the woman, um, we see it a lot in the Congo, but they were also doing it in Myanmar and in many different uh, conflicts in Syria as well. The attack on the woman to trigger the male uh, and to, to, in a way, emasculate, although I also don't like that term either, but is a tactic to both uh, demoralize the population, um, harm the men, and it causes so much emotional distress and damage to men to be forced to see the, their loved ones in their lives, you know, uh, raped or harassed or, or uh, and them being unable to fulfill their gender norm, the to be a real man to protect the family. And that's why it's so effective, and that's why they use it. Because they know that there's so much, particularly in some cultures and societies, so much wrapped around the honor of the family, and that the, it, the woman, um, the, all the burden of the honor is on her, and the man must protect her and protect the honor. And if you fail to do that, then it means you're not a man yourself. And so it's a very effective tactic of war. But I feel like this shift where we're starting to see more and more that men are also being victims of of sexual violence and that um, that the perpetration, you know, like we talked about with toxic masculinity earlier, and you don't have to be a man to practice toxic masculinity. Um, in Abu Ghraib in Iraq, you know, there were women involved in the torturing and the sexualized torturing of the men, making them wear women's underwear, forced masturbation, things like that. So um, <clears throat> I do think there is a shift in starting to understand from a more gendered perspective that um, you know 
the power that women have and the vulnerability that men have. That we've always looked at this as men are strong and powerful, women are weak and vulnerable and must be protected. But we're starting to see that shift, at least on an academic level, and usually makes it ways down, but that, um, that we're able to look at issues of justice and we're able to look at what is sexual violence and what is torture and what is legitimate acts like that from a more gendered open perspective and that that will make its way somehow into addressing those things. But um, it's a super effective tactic of war to attack the, the weak and the vulnerable and then to prevent the, those who are supposed to protect to do their job and it causes immense harm. And there's a, there's a knock on effect for generations. I mean, we see this now in post-conflict countries like Guatemala, uh, where there's a huge amount of femicide and a lot of, um, and the more that we start to understand what causes gender-based violence and the cycles of violence, a lot of it is unresolved um, pain on the male part themselves that being victims of violence, from child abuse, from uh, being abused and forced into these masculine roles, and it's a replicated type of thing. And if we don't address these in truth and reconciliation campaigns, in uh, finding ways to heal post-conflict areas, we'll see what's happening in Latin America, which is a very high rate of violence against women. And so that's, if we've got to look at, not just in disarmament, but looking at the whole reconciliation and the, the rebuilding of the community together as well. And if I may, I would like to address your question to Giorgio. How, <laughs> because it should not always be on the shoulders of the women to include the man in the conversation. So how do we get more men into the feminist discussions? Ooh. Um, that's a difficult one. First of all, uh, let me start the, the, like this. Usually, I mean, the, the field I, I, I like, I work, is arms control. If I did an event now on the New START Treaty is about to expire and I invite my target group, we would be like 20 old boys here and each of them would take the mic and have long, long, long monologues. So <laughs> I'm actually quite enthusiastic about the fact that we have young women here in the room and, and there is much more energy and interesting spirit. But you're right, we have to attract more men into this type of discussions. Um, Sincerely, I'm at the beginning of a learning curve on, on, on that respect. I, I, don't, I don't have the answer, but maybe one spontaneous thing is, um, so far I think many men think that feminism, gender-based issues don't really affect them. It's not part of their life. It's part of your life because you, you know, the very moment you, you go on a bus, you realize that you're a woman because how, you know, people treat you or push you or, or, or disrespect you or whatsoever. I don't have the proper words. For men, probably this is not their everyday reality. So somehow we must find a way to um, involve them and try to, to um, tell them that this is part of their life and uh, but in in practical terms i don't know how i just know I, that I have it, a <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So because I do trainings on gender-based violence constantly, you know, um, I've been doing uh, some work recently and always when we introduce the concept of gender, we say the word gender, which is in our title, right? That just signifies, oh, women, women. Women have gender, men don't have gender, right? But if you just talk about power, Men can understand, of course, everyone can understand. Everyone has had the experience of feeling powerful and feeling powerless. And when we introduce it from that perspective on gender-based violence, talking about abusing power or using power or how you, how you do that, it connects. And it uh, makes them, you know, oh yeah, I've got something to do with this and this has something to do with me. So personalizing it helps. I mean, you know, I think it's sad that the word gender almost means Nothing anymore. You say gender, it means women or feminism. And even feminism, what does that mean? I hear a lot about feminist foreign policy and they think, oh, that means that you'll have only women uh, politicians. You know, like, so, so again, it goes back to our language and you set the tone, I think, talking about that, Christina, about the language and how we use language. And also it's, it's gotta be about us making the men come to you. Right, bring a man to gender talk. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's a, it's, it's, 
I'm speaking for men, and I don't mean to do that, but it's like so many young men I know feel embarrassed or they don't want to be seen as interested in these things. It's very niche. It's very unusual. And But making it more about where they come forward and they're interested in these things and such as women's rights, or they're not just here because they support the women, you know, where they see it as a personal thing for themselves as well. And I think that talking more about power is uh, resonates better in some ways. Um, so it was a really interesting question because when I think about events like this, I think about them in two ways. So there's two types, right? There's an outreach event, which is talking to the general public, which is this. And then there's events or courses which are for women for spaces for growth and development. So in those spaces, I would say at the moment, the, the purpose they serve is for the growth development without the barriers of feeling awkward or uncomfortable. In outreach events, um, now, <laughs> this is the thing. So in physics, um, gender-based um, like sort of outreach worked really well when they talked about women, women, women for like five years, and then it tapered. It stopped working. The impact stopped. The reason is because you were treating women as a homogenous group. All women are the same. They all have the same problems. That's not true. That's not true. And taking fe feminism as a lens is a very academic thing to do, right? You, like you only really understand that it doesn't mean just women if you understand what the academic sources of it. What it means is more than that. It's about making spaces uh, accessible, inclusive to all different types of intersections, right? To queer people, to people of different races, to people with different socioeconomic backgrounds and using words like maybe minorities or slowly transforming and democratizing what feminism is so that people understand that it's not just about like having a woman just there would probably help because more men, like men are also not a homogenous group, right? <laughs> they, they exist with different intersections too. So if they can relate to an event and think, oh, that might be helpful to me, then that's probably going to help. Um, that's a very long-term solution in the short term, just drop the word gender, stick with minorities, something like that. Um, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just um, two things that I uh, that we've done at Well, um, well, not just us. Um, we um, saw obviously this problem is everywhere. It's in the UN. It's everywhere. You have a, a, a panel on gender. It's only the women ambassadors there. Uh, you have a, a, a side event on uh, the New Start all the men ambassadors. Um, so what we started doing is actually we, we created a hashtag. So this worked really well at the in the UN, but the UN is also a very small um, uh, place. So um, we created a, a no more um, man panels. So we called man, yeah. So we called them out, and it actually, as long as we did it, we, uh, we couldn't keep up with it because civil society has so much to do. Uh, but we're, it was a bunch of uh, organizations. But we did this, and after a while, it became a bus. It became all of a sudden. There weren't as many man panels. There were more women on the panels than before. So calling them out, mentioning it all the time, constantly. But then also, I think one important thing is asking the men these questions to go to these start side events and ask, what about feminists? What about women? Why are you all men on this panel? Why are you all over 60? Why are you all white? To ask the men the question too, because a lot of the times it's a panel like this with majority of women that get those questions. So start asking the men about these issues as well. And do you also want to touch on the on the last question oh, yeah. on on racial justice and uh, security? Yeah, I mean it's. And um, you also if you look at, at weapons, there's there's racism, there's sexism. All the bad things are captured in in uh, in the weapons and disarmament. Um, I can only, for example, in Sweden we have politicians. Uh, if we talk about the ban treaty, for example, um, they talk about unserious countries and serious countries, and it's only unserious countries that have signed on to the treaty on the provision of nuclear weapons, meaning. African countries, for example, Latin American countries, for example. There's not that many Latin American countries. Um, so there you see the racism as well. Um, it was 122 countries that uh, negotiated the, the treaty or that signed off on the treaty text on the nuclear weapon, uh, the 
uh, TPNW, Treaty on Provision, oh, there's so many. The Treaty on, Pro oh, and, and then the English. <laughs> the Treaty on the Provision of Nuclear Weapons, um, and uh, in Sweden at least, a lot, what the Swed a lot of Swedish politicians said like, well, the, the important countries weren't there, meaning NATO countries and nuclear weapon uh, countries. But they didn't mean India and Pakistan, they meant the US, France, and Great Britain. Uh, so there's, there's, of course, a lot of racism in there, and we should call it out because that's what it is, instead of saying the global south, because there's a lot of, that's what it is. To add to that, I think we need to actually directly, like, call out the fact that military is inherently a gentleman's game. When, when, the, when World War I happened and people started arming, the rules were, like, this, this goes back to, I don't know how many years ago I read about this, but the rules were a gentleman is allowed to have a weapon. What the hell is a gentleman? Let's be real. It's a white man. Uh, a young white man was allowed to have a weapon. And that has constantly perpetrated through. So countries like the UK and the US, because they've signed a treaty that inherently benefits them, are responsible nuclear states, whatever the hell that means. And India and Pakistan are rogue. Like, oh my God, they have nuclear weapons. They're rogue. India is only now just being taken seriously slightly because they have like serious connections with the UK and US, which in itself is messed up. But it's because there is a white country, a Western country that is in some control of the way that their power works. But it's not just a nuclear, it's any power. It's any power. You see this in society every day, and we should continue to call it out. Um, so thank you for raising that. that. That's a really interesting thing, and we should we should be very blatant about it. Um, and I also wanted to say that your question on Palestine was, was really interesting, and we do need to be um, acknowledging and calling out countries that are, um, you know, unknow unbeknownst or knowingly uh, actually funding these wars and funding this massacre, and it's horrible, and I don't have the experience to talk about it, but more people should. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Um, thank you for important contributions and then very interesting conversations. And there will be some drinks outside. And before we close, I just want to, on behalf of the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, make two final remarks. Um, at the Munich Security Conference, we launched the Women Experts Network, which is a network of um, experts on foreign and security policy who identify as women. It's a basic tool that if you're looking for a woman expert, you can go on the website, look for them, and contact them. So it's no excuse for men else anymore. So if you identify as a woman and if you're an expert, on foreign security policy, please do register. And if you're responsible for organizing conferences or looking for someone who can write a paper, please use our works network. And then lastly, we've been talking a lot about the importance of grassroots movements and CFFP is also, we have a membership program which helps us do a lot of the work um, that we're doing currently. So if you want to support us, do become a member. Um, and yeah, enjoy the rest of the, oh, and the, the information on the works network and the membership are outside. <laughs> Thank you. So enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you.